event of the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights and the Institute of European and Comparative Law. Um, it's also one of the first events, I suppose, we've had in person since the, not end, but the cooling down of this pandemic that has been going on. Um, we start with a real highlight. It's a great um, honor and, and, and privilege for us to have enticed Professor Philip Dunn from the Humboldt University in Berlin to make the start uh, to, to, to this event and to talk to us about his research and about some of the insights he's gained from his research on liberal constitutionalism, post-colonialism in the global south. Philip Dunn is a professor at Humboldt University in Berlin, specializing in public law and comparative law and necessarily comparative public law with a long-term focus on the south, global south but the Indian subcontinent in particular. Um, Philip will start his presentation, but allow me to speak, introduce the other speakers who will be um, commenting um, in due course uh, first so that I don't have to keep interrupting the proceedings. Um, Philip's presentation will be followed by a comment from Professor Renata Utz, who is, I think, with us online, is she? Um, Renata is a comparative constitutional lawyer at the Central European University. Um, and is speaking to us. I don't know where exactly you're speaking from. Is it, um, is it from Vienna or? London. London. Vienna. Vienna. Vienna, okay. And, um, and, and then Renata's presentation will be followed by Cato Regans. You all know Cato Regan, the director of the Bonavero Institute. And then, of course, you also know our colleague, Taryn Kaitan, who sadly uh, is prevented from being with us in person, although he is in Oxford. Um, uh, Taryn is, of course, head of research here at the Bonavero Institute. And so we propose that Philip will give, a, uh, will give his presentation first, and then we will have the commentaries, give him an opportunity to respond. But please bear in mind your own questions. Um, there will be plenty of opportunity for discussion at, uh, towards the, the, in the second half of the proceedings. So without further ado, I open the floor and hand over to you, Philip. Thanks a lot. I have to briefly arrange things here. Oops. Okay, can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, dear Birke, uh, dear Tarun, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for the, your uh, introduction uh, and the very kind uh, invitation to come to Oxford. Uh, it's actually really wonderful to be here. It's my first time in Oxford, and I think for a true academic, uh, this is a very special place and it's a very special occasion to speak here. So thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity. Um, and it's also uh, quite special for me because uh, my son is currently in his Harry Potter uh, phase of life. And so I keep hearing about uh, Dumbledore and Griffin's door and um, uh, walking around here feels a little bit like half uh, magic, half movies. Uh, and so it's quite a special uh, event for me. Yeah, but anyhow, we have more sober things to talk about, liberal constitutionalism and post-colonialism in the global south. It's probably fair to say that these are not the best days for liberal constitutionalism. I don't have to talk about the Russian aggression, which is nothing less than a direct assault on liberal constitutionalism. There are enough other places in east and west, north and south, where authoritarians contest the basic structures of liberal constitutions and liberal societies. And not only authoritarians, also from the progressive side, contestations of liberal ideas have been and are very popular these days. But what does the debate look like when analyzed through the lens of post-colonial theories or from the perspective of the global south? Is there a basic incompatibility of liberal constitutionalism and post-colonialism as some people claim? Or is it rather the other way around? Can post-colonial or southern perspectives highlight problems and also potentials of liberal constitutionalism in especially productive ways? In my brief talk today, I want to make three observations and three arguments. I will first argue that given the breadth of the terms in the title of my talk, we should not seek precise definitions, but rather be mindful of context and distinctions. I will give a few examples of how liberalism can play out in the South and come to the conclusion that there are various forms of liberalism and liberal constitutionalism and that there is no Western ownership of them. While liberalism has been 
and still can be a foil for hegemony, hegemony it is also an open source, open uh, and used by actors all over the world. In my second observation, I will analyze two major critiques that post-colonial and decolonial authors, but also other critical authors, have made about liberalism and liberal constitutionalism. One is its epistemological ignorance. The other deals with liberalism's ambivalent economic and political um, promises. I will argue, however, that these critiques do not result in a conceptual incompatibility between liberal constitutionalism and these critiques. This leads to my third and last observation, which descri describes a path forward for legal scholarship. I will argue for a southern turn in comparative legal scholarship and for thinking in varieties of constitutionalism globally. I think we need a much more foundational engagement and theorizing of the southern experiences of constitutionalism. This can make visible the problematic promises of liberal constitutionalism and address their political and economic foundations in constitutional law. So yes, I do think that studying the contestations of liberalism from a southern perspective is especially productive. But I also think that matters are actually quite entangled and what looks like a southern or post-colonial critique might be equally relevant in Europe and elsewhere too. So far for my sort of starting points, and now let me start uh, from the very beginning and explain my first observation. My hosts were kind enough to give me a very big meadow to play on today, liberal constitutionalism and post-colonialism in the global south. Given the breadth, um, it might be tempting and would be in many ways also helpful to try to, to define these broad terms first. But in my case today, I would rather make a number of distinctions to point out the very complex relationship between liberalism, um, post-colonial thinking, and the South. I think we always have to be very clear about the concrete place, the concrete time, and the concrete actors that we are talking about. Let me give you three examples. We could first think about the role of liberal ideas in the British colonization and emerging constitutionalism in India. Surely, a distorted understanding of liberalism was used by the British as a pretext and foil to justify colonial subjugation. But then again, Indian intellectuals, as much as politicians from the 19th century onwards, used liberal ideas of civil rights and collective autonomy to combat British subjugation. Also, liberal ideas had a profound impact on the Indian constitution its rights chapter, but also its system of parliamentary democracy and separation of powers are straight out of the playbook of political liberalism. In a very different context, and this is my second example, neoliberal economic ideas were used by the World Bank and the IMF in the context of Washington consensus policies in the 1980s and 90s. Here, International organizations dominated by Western powers used liberal ideas to drive economic policies in many countries in Latin America and Africa. But then again, social movements all over Latin America started to use the language of rights to fight back and claim, for example, the rights of indigenous people. A bit closer to home, we can, in a third example, think about scholarship in comparative constitutionalism in the past 30 years. As you know, this line of research emerged as a thriving field of, of scholarship in this period, but there was actually precious little attention to any variety in thinking about constitutionalism beyond liberal constitutionalism. The scholarship was, and often still is, driven by Anglo-American authors and their themes, especially a focus on rights and courts. There was little plurality and a quick disparagement of other approaches, such as authoritarian constitutionalism or, limit, uh, or constellations of limited statehood. When we look at these examples, we see that a distorted understanding of liberalism was and still is used in some context as a foil for colonial or hegemonic projects. But in other contexts, it was also a source of mobilization, emancipation, and combating hegemony. My point is that one has to be very precise about the actual place and the time about the various actors and the different forms of liberalism that were used. 
Against this background, I think it would be foolish to argue, as some people do, that there is a genuine incompatibility between liberal ideas and the interests of the South, and not even between, uh, uh, not even between post-colonial thinkers and liberalism. Liberalism is too broad, and the South is too diverse to claim incompatibility. And we can also turn this around and say there is no Western ownership of liberalism and liberal ideas. As little as Marxism is a Western concept, liberalism is not a Western concept. It is an open source which has been used all over the world by political, economic, and intellectual actors. I come to my second point, and mindful of the first observation, I start by specifying the concrete context and constellations that I want to talk about. I want to analyze central critiques that post-colonial thinkers have made with regard to liberal constitutionalism in the context of the Global South. I will focus on scholarly debates with special reference to the law. I will hence not address questions of current or pol historical political situations or activism, but talk about legal scholarship with regard to the role of liberal constitutionalism. Generally, one can say that post-colonial theory has not made great strides into legal research beyond the public international law area. There, third world approaches to international law, TWAIL, have become central in the past 20, 25 years, but this is not the case in constitutional law or in broader comparative law scholarship. Especially in comparison to other fields of the humanities and social sciences, decolonial literature has not been very prominent here. And yet, one can transpose the general critique of post-colonial authors into our area. Doing so, two main points of critique regarding liberalism stand out. The first is an epistemological critique. Postcolonial authors point out that Western liberals developed a technique of othering in which non-Western concepts were juxtaposed to Western concepts and deemed merely particular, whereas Western concepts were considered universal and superior. With regard to political theory and constitutional thinking, one can observe that originally Western notions, such as statehood or individual rights, um, uh, still provide the grammar of constitutional thinking. Another element of this epistemological critique is that the structure of knowledge productive production remained dominated by Western actors, Western fora, and Western themes. There is a persistent as asymmetry of knowledge production and dissemination, so the observation goes. While this critique has many facets, one could say that it's, it is, in essence, a critique of the intellectual and conceptual ignorance and parochialism of mainstream scholarship, especially now in the 21st century, where access to other ideas are easy. The second critique is an economic or material one, or one of political economy more broadly. In, it is inspired by post-colonial theory, but equally so by a larger critical theory. The starting point of this critique are two problematic promises of liberal constitutionalism. The first is that individual rights, and especially the right to private property, organized in a free market economy will lead to economic growth, and that this will trickle down to the benefit of the society as a whole. The other promise is that the individual right to vote in a democratic system will address the needs of all, not least the majority and the poor. The reality, as we all know, often looks very different. Private property can privilege some, and the right to vote has a limited impact on structures of power. This has a domestic di um, di dimension in the South as much as in the North, but also a global, entangled, multi-level dimension. The economic as well as the political structure of center and periphery that emerged under colonialism in many forms still persist. Liberalism is here linked to capitalism, which gets exploitative, not least when looked at from a southern perspective. So how do we respond to these points, to these critiques? Is this the end of advocating liberal ideas, especially in the south? To me, the first central question now is whether they, these points um, address inherent or in, uh, essential features of liberal constitutionalism, or whether they might be rather integrated and addressed in liberalism. I would argue for the latter. I think that both critiques can be integrated into, and in fact have been integrated into liberal constitutionalism. That, let me explain this quick, uh, briefly. 
In response to the economic critique, you can point to embedded liberalism of welfare states and its constitutional expression, expressions, for example, in Mexico, in Germany, in India or South Korea. These are states and constitutions which, though in an imperfect way, did create larger constitutional frameworks to provide so for social economic balances. At the same time, these remain at their core liberal constitutions. There is a clear, there's clearly no conceptual incompatibility between a liberal constitutional structure and a caring material constitution. In a way more fundamental is the epistemological criti critique that is the reproach of intellectual ignorance and persistent asymmetries in knowledge production and attention. I would argue, however, that this is less a problem as long as liberalism isn't hypocritical about its past and mindful of its limitations. In fact, one of the particular features of liberalism is actually its intellectual and epistemological flexibility. In fact, its ability to take on and integrate idea, ideas such as order liberalism or welfare ideas. In a way, liberal constitution, constitutionalism is an inherently experimentalist and pragmatic tradition. Also, global historians and postcolonial authors have argued in recent years that it is not very productive or even accurate to simply juxtapose North and South in terms of political theory and constitutionalism, and it is more convincing to see their entanglements and their mutual constitution. So here too, I would argue that the epistemological challenge to liberalism is less a defining characteristic of it than a challenge to reform liberal thought and address, address structures of knowledge production. I come to my third and last point, the path forward. I think it is high, high time for a southern turn in comparative constitutional scholarship. What do I mean by that? Three aspects are, th are central. First, a southern turn means taking constitutional experiences in the south seriously in a way that these jurisdictions are not just added to the roster of comparative cases, but in that the distinct experiences in the South are more broadly reflected and theorized. What we have seen in the past years is indeed a growing addition of mostly English language jurisdictions and scholarly communities to the worldwide discourse. But we have seen very little serious reflection on what explains their experiences from the perspective of their being former colonies or otherwise affected by colonialism or other forms of external domination. I think that this has in many ways been, in many cases, been a major element of constitutional experience and that we should include the influence of external and international actors more broadly in the analysis. Following from this, the second aspect of the southern turn is, uh, is, uh, addresses the epistemological critique. In order to study and reflect the constitutional experiences in the south, constitutional scholarship has to work with a greater methodological pluralism, pluralism than it has so far. While constitutional scholarship often includes historical analysis and some reflections on political ideas, it, choose, it should use more the tools of political economy and anthropology and hence delve deeper into the concrete context of constitutional developments. At least equally important in our context is that constitutional scholarship should be much more ambitious and actually reflective of its northern biases when it actually does comparative analysis. This would include a stronger reflection of positionality and more use of what I would call as to the tools of slow comparison. I think we should diversify our places of engagement, we should include um, uh, the work in different languages, and we should give scholarship more time to reflect and digest the ideas from other places. Perhaps it is helpful to resist the output expectations of the academic market from time to time in order to open the challenge, in order to open uh, and to challenge Western notions, contextualize or re uh, rethink them. In a way, this is a task of such intellectual and habitual magnitude that we should give us some time and the idea of slow comparison might give us a frame to do so. This brings me to my third aspect of the southern turn. I think that such a turn in constitutional law scholarship should ultimately address 
the varieties of constitutionalism in the whole world and not just in the South. To explain this, I should say a few words about the notion of the global South. I think using this notion poses difficulties since it is indeed vague and seems over-inclusive. Many people argue, therefore, that taking into account regional ex experiences is more important and more productive, for example, Latin American constitutionalism, South Asian constitutionalism, and the like. And to some extent, I agree that geopolitical constellations of a region influence the constitutional experiences there, and one has to be mindful of that. But I don't think that doing one excludes the other. Using the lens of the South points to an important element of constitutional experiences all over the world, namely the encounter with the West as an external force and the consequences of living with structures of center and periphery in epistemological, philosophical, and economic terms over a longer time. Following this line of thought, the notion of the global South then is ultimately not geographical. There is North in the South and South in the North. The notion then signals rather a constitutional sensibility for marginalization in terms of in legal and constitutional, but also epistemological and economic terms. And such a sensibility might go a long way in constitutional scholarship and practice. I come to the end. I hope it became clear that I don't see any conceptual incompatibility between liberal constitutionalism and post-colonial thought. Rather, I see a chance and perhaps even a necessity for a more serious and potentially very productive line of engagement. Such an engagement I have turned a southern turn. At the end of the day, such a turn is not only about the south, but it's actually a double turn. It starts with a more serious theoretical engagement with constitutional experiences in the South, but that includes already a reflection on, their, on its entanglement with the North, and hence leads to a renewed study of Northern constitutionalism too, and their mutual entanglements. Being mindful of these influences and entanglements is also a way to address why and how the economic and political promises of liberalism might have failed in the South as well as in the North. As we all know, critique and contestations of liberal constitutionalism are not only a phenomenon of the South, and understanding the epistemological and material failings of liberal constitutionalism might help us a long way to defend and to renew, perhaps, a liberal model also in Europe. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Philip. I must say this uh, notion of slow comparison greatly appeals to me. I mean, we know that slow food is all about mindfulness. I think what you've really shown us is also how this mindfulness then leads to a very nuanced and differentiated account of what is sometimes, you know, a, a quite hard positions in a in a political field. So, so, so I, I, I that, that was extremely thoughtful and and very thought provoking. Um, we're now going to come to uh, Renata Utz, um, who's giving the first comment. Renata, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for, for including me in, at, at this wonderful event. I, I really regret that I, I cannot be there, there in, in, in person. And this is just to confirm that I'm in, in, in Vienna for, for a place that, a university that had to move borders due to a, a bit of a pickle for being too, too liberal in, in a political context, but this was not appreciated anymore. Uh, it was an immense pleasure to, to, to read the book, and, and actually I taught the introductory chapter this year in a, uh, in a comparative con law class to, to a very global um, audience. So if, if you'd like to compare notes, then, then we could do that later. I, I, I think that, that uh, or I read the, the book as an extremely mighty potion, which is part stock taking, part critical self-reflection, and part a provocation. I wouldn't want to define the, the exact proportions of, of the three components of the potion, but definitely the first chapter reads as a manifesto for, for regime change in, in comparative constitutional scholarship. Now, to, to be more serious about it, the, the book does intend to, to open new horizons. Um, and, and I especially like uh, the, the, the shift 
to talking about constitutional experiences as as opposed to as opposed to constitutional uh, norms and and especially judicial production and i and i know that when we talk about constitutional experiences in the global south context uh, this is a rather provocative tag to use because very often uh, students from the global south would tell in in the classroom that the westerners know the law and and we have an experience that we are accounting for so so this was actually a, a very provocative tag and i re read this as a provocative tag and and i will come back to to this at the at the end of of of, of, of my comments uh i i really find it refreshing that the whole the collection as as a whole uh moves away from from asking how legal comparative constitutional scholarship should be and 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 goes to to foundational issues to to have a conversation through really tough questioning about the the dominance of of a liberal constitutionalist approach in 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 the literature now uh what i what i believe is is very important in 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 the book in the chapters is pushing us to to account for the for the fact that constitutions are, are textual reflections of compromises that are reached in debate and the jurisprudence itself is is a continuation of this debate now the reader the reason why this matters is that liberal perspectives at the time of constitution making, whether in India, South Africa, or Hungary, were one of many perspectives around the table, and, and actually the text itself was, was shaped very often by conservatives, uh, some of them religious, some of them socially conservative, nationalist, Marxist, and the like around the table. And, and in a way, the, the perceived dominance of, of liberals in constitutional scholarship is, is the doing of our own, because scholars at a particular historic moment, when constitutional democracy was meant to have its, its triumph, emphasized the liberal traits in these debates and the liberal traits in the text um, that were, that were hammer, hammered out through constitutional negotiations. Now, when we when we focus too much on the liberal, of course, two two things happen happen. Liberalism becomes monolithic, and and we lose the lose the 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 understanding that it, liberalism was was shaped as much, and liberal scholars, actors, politicians, were, were shaped as much by by the founding debates as as their counterparts or negotiators around uh, around the, the table and I and I actually find very very refreshing a, a volume on uh, uh, by by two two scholars people um, uh, and I'm saying and Abdi Hussein on Nero in debate the the interesting bit about the Nero book is that they are not lawyers so the people who are interested in the debates that shape Nehru's thought uh, are actually not, not the lawyers. And I, and I think that the, the southern turn perspective, which, which Philip advocates uh, with, with the volume, is to actually bring us back to, to these formative debates and fo force us to, to unearth uh, the various stakes and, and how compromises were reached. And, and of course, I mean, Tarun needs no advertising in this group, but definitely your, your article on, on directive principles is an extremely important contribution. And so is a, a chapter by Arun Tirun Vegadam and, and Jürgen Bast in another collection, which, which Philip also edited on, on, on Indian and, and EU constitutionalism. So, uh, I, I, I hope that, that the volume pushes us and, 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 and the methodological uh, approaches in, in the volume will push us to, to understand that, that liberalism is actually more liberalisms, as intellectual historians like to, to talk about it, and invite the engagement with, with others who were around the table and this is as much a global south exercise as a, as a global north exercise. Now, the tricky business here is that we are rereading, we are reading and rereading these debates in, in a politically charged local 
context, uh, where the old nationalist, conservative, and liberal and Marxist arguments will, will read very differently. Uh, and I, I believe that, that one of the, the differences which academics should account for is the, the increasingly limited academic freedom in some of the universities where some scholars are producing this rereading as, uh, as if a re revisionist autobiography of, of constitutions in, in conditions of academic and intellectual unfreedom. So uh, it's not only, so on the one hand, of course, we are all experiencing the, 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 the frontal attack on liberal democracy and previously we were playing around with a little bit of Modi and criticizing Bolsonaro and Orban and Trump. Uh, the Russian attack showed the stakes uh, and, and it actually put the lives of Ukrainian, Russian and Belarusian scholars on, on the line for defending silly little things like judicial independence. But ultimately, uh, and, and so when we focus on this, we should also be mindful of the fact that there is plenty of, of comparative scholarship in English language in unfree academic context, which are trying to, to write alternative histories and alternative theories uh, of, of these constitutions in, in political, in political contexts that matter for, for our critical reading of, of some of this production. Now, the second point I, I would like to make much more briefly is about the, 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 the perspectives from which we make any critique and self-critique of, of scholar, liberal constitutional scholarship. And, and of course, privilege comes from, in, in many forms, it's really nice to be safe and sound in, in, in a, in a, at a proper university in a full-time position. We shouldn't also forget that it's very nice to have funding for these projects and the Singapore School shows how good funding actually permits school building uh, within a, with a very, very brief time, but also that kind of school building is uh, intellectual school, I, I, I meant, um, is, is very resource intensive. And uh, of course, when it comes to when it comes to privilege, we, we sometimes are, are likely to discount how some people or some authors who write from a privileged privileged position might actually take that particular spot due to historic accidents. And the illustration I would like to to bring here doesn't come from from comparative law it, because I, I think a visual in, illustration is is stronger here. Uh, the iconic photos of, of Gandhi's death and Nehru as a statesman addressing a crowd were made by a Frenchman working from Magnum agency. Magnum is a huge agency today and, uh, and the real mogul or big, big player of the field. At the time it was starting out, it was a historic accident that Cartier-Bresson was on the field, partly because of his wife and joining her in, in traveling the region. Uh, and he certainly had trained intuition, trained intuition on how to capture a decisive moment. But ultimately, his perspective cannot really be equated to a colonizer's gaze trying to, trying to dominate and steal a historic moment from an entire nation. And I'm pretty sure that we can find we can find alternatives in scholarship. We don't have to look terribly far. So in closing, I, I really would like to, to praise the volume's focus on, on constitutional experience in the sense as it's used in the volume as, as a unit of constitutional uh, analysis. It's definitely refreshing because it moves away from jurist-centric jurist views of, of analyzing, uh, especially comparing constitutional regimes and, and moves the debate away from, from just condemning juristocracy. I believe that it helps in basing the diversity and, and the multivocality of the subject of constitutional scholarship because it invites engaging with political processes that shape constitutions and the actors that, tend to, that, that we do not tend to account for when we center on courts and a few privileged players. It allows us to account for dialogues and debates
on which lives and and uh, were staked. And and I the way I read this is that it's not an invitation to study the South more carefully, but it's very much an invitation for critical self reflection like reflection for scholars from the global north. And when I was reading the volume, I was just thinking that European institutional scholarship certainly needs a healthy, healthy dose of self-reflection these days. So this is where I would like to, to, to stop. And Philip, thank you so very much for putting this volume on our tables. And thank you, Renata. Um, I think also for reminding us that you know we th there's a there's a certain narrow notion of the law that we sometimes work with, and that actually there is much more much more much richer um, background, which isn't just the non-legal context, which is actually in, could, can be seen as being ingrained in in the, our understanding of the law itself. Um, Kate, would you like to add uh, yes, some comments sure. of your own? Uh, thanks, Birka, but I'd just like to start firstly by welcoming Philip. It's wonderful that you've got here, Philip. It's so nice to see somebody in person yeah, and have a conversation. I'm only sorry that Taran and Renata aren't here. And secondly, I'd like to thank Birka. It's great to be partnering with the IUCL uh, on this and look forward to further conversations of this sort and, and possibly even looking at research projects going forward. Um, so Philip has made three mar remarks this evening, or three sort of propositions this evening. First that in assessing or examining liberal constitutionalism, we need to be conscious of con context. He gave us examples of the different ways in which liberal constitutionalism was, constitutionalism was employed, for example, in political contestation during the colonial period. He noted that both colonial powers and those struggling against colonia colonialism employed the vocabulary of liber liberal constitutionalism and that in many cases, those who'd sought to end colonialism adopted forms of liberal constitutional texts at the end of their struggles. Some of those, of course, we know were largely imposed by the colonial powers, but some of them were genuine exercises in constitution making in the relevant states. So Philip concluded that we cannot assert a necessary correlation, or sorry, contradiction between liberal constitutionalism, Peter can't hear, between liberal constitutionalism, sorry, and post-colonial uh, or decolonizing projects. Liberal constitutionalism remains an open source concept, he says, which has been used by actors in a range of contexts and times. Second, he pointed to two major critiques of the liberal con constitutional project. The epistemological one, in which concepts rooted in Western political and philosophical traditions are prioritized, and concepts from the global south are othered or excluded. And an economic or material one, in which the links between economic liberalism in its classical or neoliberal form and the political project of liberal constitutionalism are exposed, and li liberal constitutionalism is argued to be an ally of global capitalism. And thirdly, Philip has argued for a sudden turn. The first, that we take more seriously the experience of constitutionalism in the global south. Secondly, that we have a more inclusive methodology and conceptual repertoire and that we are more self-consciously critical of the methodologies and concepts we use. And thirdly, that we should think about varieties of constitutionalism across the global south and perhaps across the globe, and not necessarily root them in regions, something which I'm finding very interesting. There's a sort of an emerging conversation about African constitutionalism, and it's an interesting question to me whether we should talk about Africa as a project at all, and certainly as African constitutionalism as a project. Um, and he emphasizes, and I rather like this, this idea of South should recognize that epistemological and economic marginalization happens both within the global North and within the global South and across them. So these are all very interesting observations and I share, uh, agree with much of what Philip has said. And I've got two sets of comments I'm going to make. The first is about defining our terms. Um, Philip starts off by expressly, started off by expressly stating he's not going to define liberal constitutionalism. And I want to talk a little bit about the project of definition. And secondly, I want to talk about the, the project of research, thinking about what this sort of set of arguments we put together, Philip, might mean for our development of a research agenda. And I, I think uh, at the Bonavera in particular, we're really interested in thinking about a research agenda uh, w uh, in this field. So, you know, be very interested to hear what those of you here might say about it. But first to the question of definitions. It does seem to me that we're going to need a definitional conception of liberal constitutionalism 
a capacious one to be sure, that enables us to explore what is happening in constitutional settings in the global south that will enable both comparison and critique. In thinking about how to approach the task of definition, I have four thoughts. The first is that a plausible definition will be multivalent and complex. It will recognize that this concept of liberal uh, constitutionalism has both normative and institutional elements. It's not just one thing. In this regard, I'm minded of debates about the concept of the rule of law. There's an enormous scholarship that seeks to define the rule of law. Some scholars focus on the qualities that must inhere in law and, must, and how adjudication should take place if the rule of law is to exist. You can think of Lon Fuller and his Eight Principles, or Joseph Raz's more recent work identifying 11, both of them trans, sort of, uh, including both institutional considerations and normative ones. And then there's another scholarship which focuses on the purpose of the rule of law. For example, Martin Krager's work, who argues that the overall purpose of the rule of law is to prevent the arbitrary use of power. In my view, a definition of the rule of law has to be multivalent and has to contain both normative, institutional, and arguably teleological elements. We can't just go with one. And I think the same thing is so for liberal constitutionalism. Uh, so a plausible definition of the root of law must be, valent, must be multivalent, underpinned by different principles and purposes, different understandings of the norms at play and the institutions. And importantly, we need to recognize that at times, those elements will be in conflict with one another. So properly understood, the rule of law, and I would argue liberal constitutionalism, is not one thing. It's a cluster concept that draws on what may at times be competing principles and purposes. And that's one of the reasons why liberal constitutionalism and the rule of law can often be relied on on both sides of what can be an intense political argument. Secondly, I think the definition cannot decide a priori the relationship between liberal constitutionalism and economic or material forces. This is often presumed. It seems to me that our definition of liberal constitutionalism should recognize the contingency of that relationship and not presume it. Not to say that at times liberal constitutionalism hasn't served and may has often have served particular economic forces but to say that it always will seems to me to be uh, an assertion without an empirical foundation and is only going to problematize our use of the phrase liberal constitutionalism. And I think a lot of the critiques of liberal constitutionalism start with exactly that premise. Thirdly, I think the definition should speak to practice. Liberal constitutionalism is a concept that is rooted in political practice, in moral claims and beliefs and in the work of institutions and actors around the world. To speak of liberal constitutionalism means something to political actors in many parts of the world. And that meaningfulness is important. And any definition of liberal constitutionalism we adopt needs to speak to that practice. If it's not recognized at all by those who are engaging in struggles around liberal constitutionalism, in my view, it is not a valuable definition. Fourthly, and here I agree with Philip, I think we need to be ex inclusive in our definition and look to concepts beyond those in the classical canon. But I also think we need to be cautious here and to avoid an uncritical and unreflective acceptance of new concepts simply because they come from the global south, simply because they are operationalized in political language in the global south. However we are going to define liberal constitutionalism, we need to make sure that all the concepts we employ are subject to robust critique as well. And finally, and this is a normative claim, I think that we need to, we need to do the task of purpose. And uh, that's the sort of Craigian task in, in the rule of law, which you know, in the rule of law, Craigian has talked about um, the avoidance or pre prevention of um, uh, 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 arbitrary, the exercise of arbitrary power. I mean, maybe it's just this week, but it seems to me that one of the key elements of liberal constitution is about the creation and protection of political space, space for organizing and expression, for disagreement and dissent, for changing the, those in authority, political authority, 
and it is often to be understood as against as organized and totalitarian power, especially state power. I think there's a strong normative element to what we're talking about, and I would see it very much more in political terms, and that's why I would leave the question of its relationship to the econ economy and material considerations as a question. But I wouldn't leave its, its, um, its relationship to notions of creating political space as a question. To me, that is the normative purpose of liberal constitutionalism. Of course, it often fails in this game. So that, those are some thoughts about towards a definition of liberal constitutionalism. My second set of remarks relates to the research agenda we might develop in this turn of comparative constitutional law. The first thing I think we need to note is that Philip's uh, sort of insistence on context with which I, I agree creates immense difficulties for comparative lawyers. The more we are contextual, the thicker our, def uh, our descriptions, our analysis, the harder it is to really do comparative work that is useful at all. Because, frankly, we eventually get to the point where we realize that every society's engagement with these ideas is so rich and detailed and nuanced and so much a product of history, economics, social and cultural factors that actually to try to draw comparisons is often somewhat superfluous or pu purposeless. Um, but nevertheless, I would think that one of the first big re research agendas might be to interrogate the emergence of liberal constitutionalism in the global south. And here it seems to me that there are at least two paradoxes. The first is that the emergence of liberal constitutionalism in the global south, particularly in the last 30 years, which is really what we're largely thinking about, has come at about the same time as neoliberal global econ economics have closed down the power of individual states globally. In other words, the capacity of states to run their economies is narrower now than it has been for a very long time. And that's been a post-1980s phenomenon. That means that we're creating, as it were, the space for political contestation, the space for political debate, if that is the normative purpose of liberal constitutionalism, right at the moment we're controlling the levers of state power, at least in relation to economic questions, is one of the, we have least power, you know, individual states have least power over that. And I don't see that changing. So one can talk about the Bretton Woods institutions if you want, uh, you know, the IMF and the World Bank and the Washington Consensus. Yes, we can. But we, what we really need to realize is that this is a product of a globalized world. A lot of this is driven by technology and capacity and, um, and private actors and not entirely driven by the kind of the models of the, of the Bretton Woods order. Um, so that's the first paradox, the narrowing of state autonomy, especially in relation to economic affairs, that is coinciding with this emergence of uh, liberal constitutionalism in the global south. The second paradox is the persistent ambivalence towards liberal constitutional in the global south even in circumstances where very clearly liberal constitutional orders are in place if one looks at the text of the Constitution, and even if you look at the practice. I mean, South Africa is a classic case in point. Uh, and of course, we always talk about our home places, but anybody who's been watching the debate in South Africa over the last week about South Africa's response to the invasion of Ukraine in flagrant breach of international law by the Russian Federation sees this ambivalence at play. Now, one of the questions is, you know, what are the sources of that ambivalence? What does it mean? How does it work out in the practice of liberal constitutionalism? But it's a clear paradox, and I think you'll find that it's quite widely spread. In some ways, the democratic decay in the global north is an emergence of a similar um, ambivalence towards liberal constitutionalism. But in many ways, that ambivalence, I think, was predated the global north and the global south, and it might be very interesting to do some comparisons looking at how that ambivalence has worked out. Um, secondly, I think that, the, you know, this is back to the context point. I think the histories of the democracies of the global south are important in understanding their constitutional democracies. Now, some of those are common histories. So, for example, the history of colonization <coughs> with different imperial powers. There is no doubt that the pattern of British colonialism has established certain commonalities between, in the post-colonial states that emerged 
from any period of time as British co colonies. And similarly with the Francophone, uh, the Francophonie, you see those similar patterns. And then there are other things too. The fact that boundaries in most post-colonial states do not match language or ethnic groups or historical polities. The ways in which boundaries were drawn in the period of colonialism has persist, uh, uh, you know, was very erratic and arbitrary, and those boundaries have largely persisted. So a lot of the theoretical thinking around political philosophy and the idea of the kind of nation state really has absolutely no place at all in most countries of the global south. And that's a commonality which I think might be interesting to ex explore. Um, and it may, it may provide a useful frame for comparative work. Um, so I also think that the, the last thing I want to say is that I think uh, an, a research agenda here might explore more closely the project of decolonial scholarship. The temporal alignment, as I've said already, of liberal colonialism of constitutionalism with colonialism and neoliberalism has raised ready critiques of liberal constitutionalism, often based on an, a premise that liberal constitutionalism is a necessary ally or um, link with forms of colonialism and neoliberalism. These fly under the banner of twail, critical legal scholarship, etc. However, much decolonizing scholarship assumes, perhaps uncritically, a shared normative perspective with strong nationalist elements and a disregard for the power tempering elements of liberal constitution, cost, constitutionalism. It's very interesting how, effort, how often decolonial scholarship seems to echo some of the things that you might say as the ambivalent anti-liberal constitutionalism is saying in the global south. And I think as scholars, we ought to be investigating this. I think it emerges both in political discourse, but also in court judgments and in, um, in um, the, the way in which organizations, political parties and, and other political organizations work. So I think we need to interrogate those assumptions and that, schol and that scholarship. And finally, I, I, I just want to say something which I think is important and may not fit right across the global south, but we need to recognize that Post-colonial, uh, sorry, post-colonial constitutionalism and liberal constitutionalism have been grafted onto existing rootstock in each of the places where they are, <coughs> to use a gardening metaphor. We still haven't fully addressed and investigated how that rootstock is working with liberal constitutionalism. So in South Africa, I think about um, what is called indigenous law, African customary law, African traditional leadership. These are real political uh, institutions and sets of rules and systems that predated liberal constitutionalism and which haven't gone away and which are now beginning to be, as in any grafted plant, producing some very interesting phenomena. These are not often looked at by scholars of the global north, but I think they're very important both for scholars but also politically important in many places in the global south. So I think this is a uh, there's a fascinating research agenda to be built here, Philip. I'm very pleased that you're here to, um, to raise these questions with us, and I look forward to further conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And I can see Philip scribbling away uh, frantically <laughs> to take notes. And I think you've given him, and in fact all of us for the later discussion, a very big job to even start thinking about the definitional issues and the, the, how to sort of turn this into a, 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 a framework for a research agenda. So thank you. Um, Taryn, it's your turn now. Thank you very much, <coughs> Rebecca. And um, I am also extremely grateful uh, to the IACL for organizing this, co-organizing this with, with the Bonavero. I'm very sorry for not being there in person today, um, socially distancing. And, uh, and Philip, what a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Um, so one of the problems with being the last commentator after two extremely clever ones is that everything you wanted to say has been said and better. So, so much of what I will do is probably repeat uh, less elegantly, but I think to the extent that it, it helps uh, to, to, to hear similar ideas in different modes, I think uh, it might still be valuable. So um, Philip, I, I think I will start by uh, referring to your fantastic metaphor that I think Kate also uh, invoked, uh, li liberalism as an open source. And I think 
uh, that is really apt and it captures um, so much of the debate on liberalism. It's also extremely refreshing to see somebody who, I think if, if, uh, if I may say, so, so somebody who does not self-identify as working within the liberal tradition, actually taking the time to, uh, to engage with nuance and thoughtfulness uh, rather than a more um, uh, superficial rejection. So, so I think your engagement has been, uh, I, I, I found the engagement with liberal thought and your ideas really refreshing. And you know, like any long-standing ideology, be it feminism or Marxism, liberalism is a large family of ideas, uh, one that spans the entire range of possibilities from libertarianism to robustly egalitarian versions. But unlike Philip, many of the critics of liberalism are far less nuanced and less learned. Um, so in my view, you know, neither unrestricted property rights um, are a floor in all liberal thought, nor the mere right to vote a ceiling in its conception of political participation. And I've written about this in a, a paper on plutocracy, which I'm sure you've seen, Philip. But, um, and I think, you know, I've often asked some of my critical slash post-colonial friends, self-identified, um, you know, what they understand a liberal to be. And answers often range from a mixing up of neoliberals with liberals to pointing out 19th century liberal imperialists. And of course, many Marxists and feminists in the 19th century were racial uh, imperialists too, and several liberals opposed to colonialism. So I think, you know, if you wanted to pass on definitions, but I think if there's a core defining feature of liberalism, uh, which is common to the entire range, um, I think it is, an, it is a deep skepticism of concentrated power. And the long-standing debate within liberalism has been a disagreement about whether this con skepticism of concentrated power should extend only to the state, which is the wrong view in my view, uh, or to all forms of concentrated power. So that I believe is the essence. Um, but so much of critical scholarship engages with a straw man uh, liberalism, which starts with Locke and stops at Mill. Um, and this, I believe, is as illiterate in terms of history of ideas as politicizing feminism for things Mary Wollstonecraft might have written. Um, there's often a general disbelief um, when I explain that John Rawls, you know, the reigning high priest of liberal theory of, over the last 50 years, uh, believed that liberalism was incompatible with capitalism, even welfare capitalism. Right? That he, and this is this is a quote from Rawls that I start my paper on plutocracy with, right? and explain that uh, you know for Rawls the only way for a state to be liberal was for for it to either be socialist or to be a, what he described as a property owning democracy. Uh, on the other hand, perfectionist liberals like Joseph Raz, whose key book on liberalism called Morality of Freedom has a long diatribe against individualism, again, ascribed as one of the cardinal sins of liberalism. Right? And here I quote from Raz, rights alone cannot provide a complete account of morality. Personal autonomy is incompatible with moral individualism and strong rights against coercion. Since autonomy requires not just options, but acceptable options, and so on. Right? So here are these are not outliers in liberal thought, right? Rawls and Raz today are the defining liberal thinkers, one of whom believes that liberalism is incompatible with capitalism, and the other believes that liberalism is incompatible with moral individualism. So, um, so I think the problem is when, when an unscholarly, ahistorical dismissal of in gay of liberalism becomes a weapon to legitimize, I think mostly unconsciously or un unintendedly, much of the repression in the South, usually in the South, by neo-autocrats like Modi, who use the dismissal of liberalism's legitimacy in Northern University campuses 
as the rationale to deny the claim of extremely marginalized groups within the South, which are often framed in a liberal vocabulary. So, which is why, Philip, I really uh, uh, endorse and welcome your, uh, your open source metaphor. And I think that uh, a much broader take up of that idea within, within post-colonial uh, approaches uh, will be extremely welcome. Um, now, shifting gears somewhat to post-colonialism itself, unlike liberalism, post-colonialism is a relatively new school of thought. Of course, it has a longer intellectual history in, uh, in critical studies and other traditions, but it is already showing similar signs of malleability. Its contemporary use, I think Kate was hinting at it, includes its weaponization in places like India, where it is increasingly deployed by academic apologists for Hindu majoritarianism, who portray India's encounter with Islam in the past as its first colonization, preceding the British Raj, and therefore then <clears throat> colonize India from lingering Islamic influences. Furthermore, I believe that you know there is an imperialism in telling Southerners to reject liberalism because it's Western. Um, I, I think giving universalist ideas, and this here I include Marxism, liberalism, feminism, and post-colonialism, um, a geographically rooted, um, not just origin, but applicability, um, claims ideas as ours or theirs, even if it is only for criticism and rejection. So even the critical post-colonial rejection of liberalism as Western denies its authenticity of use in Southern context. Uh, it's also not uh, irrelevant to mention that post-colonialism itself has largely originated and flourished in Western campuses, albeit with significant um, inputs from the diaspora. And I remain uncertain about its actual interest in or commitment to the South. Um, and this is obviously a comment on the, on the approach more broadly rather than your own scholarship, Philip. But um, I, I do think that much of its concern remains sanitizing Northern spaces of lingering racialized structures of the empire in the North in at least the versions of post-colonialism that are often uh, extremely popular in British and American campuses seem to me to be primarily concerned with British and American lives. And that's not a bad thing, but, but I, I, I believe that the historical contingency uh, is, is as northern perhaps as, as some, of, some of the liberals. Um, so Philip, I think your real target, and I believe much more on the mark, um, is the is contemporary constitutional studies, which I would distinguish from liberalism as, an, as a normative ideal or an ideology. Um, and again, you know, like Kate and Renata, there's, there's much in your talk that I agree with. So I'll, I'll just offer a, a few uh, caveats or footnotes. Right? So this is our discipline and, you know, or, or field um, but in our field, the axis of intellectual domination, I believe, is not, and you, of course, say this in your talk, too, but it's not quite the global north and south axis. I think, rather, the canon is largely comprised of the United States uh, and, and Germany to some extent. So vast swathes of the north are as much absent from the field um, as of the south. You know, uh, whoever heard of uh, Swedish constitutionalism explaining anything <laughs> in of constitutional studies, for example. You know, perhaps ironically, contemporary efforts of constitution making, usually in southern spaces over the last 20 years, places like Nepal and Afghanistan, may have given the South uh, some more attention in the field than relatively more stable qualities in the North. So this is not to deny the power dynamics that, that inflects um, and the and the unidirectional mode of knowledge that that often flows in these contexts, but I'm but I'm just complicating the 
the tidiness of the North-South divide in, in comparative quantitative studies. Uh, finally, you know, uh, just a couple of more minor comments. I fully second your in invitation to interdisciplinarity, but with a strong caveat of actual training in the in the other disciplined <laughs> lawyers, um, and dare I say, uh, uh, American lawyers or American trained lawyers uh, show a remarkable um, ability to 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 employ tools of disciplines that one is not trained in. And I can speak with with any uh, degree of competence only only on law and anthropology in India. I think it is mired with deep methodological issues, often conducted by untrained lawyers, uh, with with very limited or no claims of representation uh, or sample selection, but but making very broad um, generalized claims. And I, I suspect whether a, a stronger disciplinary interdisciplinary ins insistence on traditional sociological methods uh, and the discipline of case selection of sampling of evidence gathering of rigorously uh, getting training and adhering to it might not be more conducive to developing the discipline. Um, on, on your regional studies argument, I, I wondered if the recent mushrooming of Islamic, Buddhist, socialist, authoritarian, and military constitutionalism uh, is actually well, A, I think it's entirely welcome, but also I believe that it's it's certainly a counterpoint to the hitherto regional focus, and we may well already see the discipline developing in directions that you think are welcome. Uh, I also agree with you on context sensitivity, but I do worry about context fetishism, and again, Kate nodded in this direction too. <coughs> studies, for example, that insists on the impossibility of any general claims drawing upon the supposed indispensability of context. I think this is basically a threat to all normative scholarship, which assumes rather than defends that scholarship, constitutional scholarship can only be and must only be descriptive. Needless to say, like the assaults on liberal thoughts, uh, this provides legitimacy to the neo-autocrats of the day um, as well, where, where our discipline is all about describing and not about judging. Um, so ultimately, I believe both liberalism and post-colonialism are interested in power and in distinguishing legitimate power from illegitimate power and in taming it. They share a common pursuit, properly understood, or at least generously understood, um, and have much to learn from each other's emphases. Uh, so an attack on Strom, and I, and I recognize that much of the critical studies and, and post-colonial uh, ideas that I have attacked just now, but also Stroman, right? uh, and we can, it's easy to find Stroman in, 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 in each approach, but, but that's, that's the impulse we need, need to resist and to have what you have, I think, invited us to do is to do it, is to have a more genuine, engaged, um, and sincere engagement with each other's ideas where, where liberal is not used as a term of abuse, and maybe, maybe it's foolishness to even engage, even criticize when we criticize ideas, maybe we should criticize individuals uh, or individual scholars and their ideas, because if, if post-colonialism and liberalism mean many things and can be used and abused and weaponized, maybe it's best to focus on one person and really read what they are saying rather than, rather than uh, you know, think about what, what the school stands for based on our own intellectual training uh, and what we have gathered from osmosis of our supervisors. Um, <laughs> So you know, as intellectual approaches go, they're all open-ended, and of course subject to the power dynamics that necessarily inflect all aspects of our life, including scholarship. So your call for greater sensitivity to all of this is entirely unexceptionable. And I think as, as one practical step, perhaps you know we can agree today, I think both liberals and post-colonials of the right sort <laughs> will, will, will find it easy to agree, agree upon today. Right? As peer reviewers, let us agree to always refuse to accept papers that make universal claims based on northern case studies alone, right? or, or especially in our field, comparative constitutional studies, right? demand a reason for the inclusion of the United States in the case study. Right? It is one extremely parochial and, dare I say, pathological jurisdiction. <laughs> it's not self-evident why it should be part of every single comparative case study. Right? Tell us why it's relevant to the study. And, and I think that will be a good start to, to, to shifting our discipline somewhere. Uh, but but in, the, in the final analysis, and I will end with this, right, more rigorous disciplinary adherence, um, I think, uh, to the tools of truth-seeking and, and knowledge creation might actually be better antidote to power 
in the academy and uh, the academy's engagement with power rather than a direct pursuit of purging it from power. I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Taryn. Um, thank you also for reminding us and illustrating the complexity of this map of the, the world that we're broadly calling Global North and Global South. Philip already alluded to it, but I think you've also illustrated the potential lopsidedness of, of it all. Um, thank you also for putting a spotlight on the value of interdisciplinarity, for um, setting out the, some of the jurisprudential and political theory background so, so forcefully, though I note again with sort of thinkers illustrated when I reference to thinkers of the, in the global north, um, and, and for also illustrating some of the political reality on the ground, the struggles, the tensions as they play out, in, as, as these debates play out in, with regard to particular questions, and the way they're perhaps instrumentalized in jurisdictions, um, and, and you gave a vivid example of that. So I know that Philip has had a lot of food for thought, probably more than he, he can digest, and it certainly wasn't slow food, um, but, uh, Philip, you do have an opportunity to respond and, and to, you know, take, take the time you need because there is an awful lot in there and perhaps you would like to flag things that you, you, want to, uh, you would like the debate then to go into further. Mm -hmm. Is this on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> great. Thanks. This is really extremely rich, uh, what's on the table now um, <laughs> and difficult to choose from. Uh, perhaps just a, a few, um, just a few remarks, and then I'm really actually quite quite interested and uh, and curious to hear what uh, what, what else comes uh, in, uh, from 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 the audience here. Um, just a, uh, very briefly, um, I mean, first of all, yeah, Renata, thanks a lot. I think you really um, uh, hit the nail uh, when you try to um, sort of describe a little bit the agenda. Um, um, of that larger volume um, and, uh, and, uh, and the southern turn idea that it is uh, uh, stock taking uh, reflection and also to some extent um, uh, provocation and, uh, um, and and you also I think made a very imp important point um, with respect to um, pointing out how multivocal and plural most constitutional and political processes are and that there is a dissonance between the perhaps um, uh, sort of the focus on liberal ideas in scholarship and the plurality of the political process, and I think th this is this goes right to the core um, of what I, I'm I'm often thinking about that one has to uh, somehow um, um, uh, be mindful of that plurality um, of that uh, and multifacetedness uh, and, and the like, and that also is something that um, Tarun uh, picked up on on uh, uh, in the very end. Um, perhaps just um, uh, one, uh, yeah, it's it's a little overwhelmed, but let's let's just one um, one point on the on the def definitional thing. I, I entirely agree the uh, and, and see the urge, and I think you've already, uh, Kate, you've already marked very important kind of uh, railings uh, around how to do this and what should f uh, flow into this. Um, but I think already listening to your, I think, uh, five points. Uh, sort of seem to prove my point. I mean, <laughs> how do you combine that in a definition? Um, and uh, I mean, um, I, I'm, I'm in, in Berlin, part of this uh, cluster, uh, research cluster on uh, contestations of the liberal script. And they have tried that. Um, the political theorists have, mm -hmm. have tried that. And I think Tarun, in a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of ingenious way, has captured, of course, a very central element uh, the, the, the skepticism about concentrated power. I think that is, that is uh, extremely um, uh, helpful already. But once you start fleshing it out a little bit and then taking, sort of trying to avoid hitting these railings, then it becomes extremely complex. So I just wonder to what extent investing time into that kind of definition uh, is well, well invested or rather uh, kind of a bottom up uh, inductive kind of um, uh, sort of um, uh, research agenda that looks more at the different constellations and contexts and cases and, and the like in order to then get a broad kind of understanding. And perhaps also one other um, uh, point in this regard, um, I think what I find extremely helpful when trying to somehow define the field is to think about the other and to think what is it actually that you would juxtapose to liberal constitutionalism. And, and that's how I came into this whole, whole thinking about so 
about the varieties. Um, if you, if you, I mean, uh, if that is a way to perhaps describe authoritarian, theocratic, whatever, feminist, th there are lots of offers by now, uh, but that might be helpful to then be able to at least um, distinguish a little bit what we might, what we might find distinctive about uh, about liberal constitutionalism. It's not never complete uh, in a way, but perhaps that's a uh, that's a way to think about this. Um, also, one 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 um, um, thought on your research agenda, um, which I think very fascinating. I'm very happy to continue thinking about this. To what extent can one uh, perhaps sort of describe a larger uh, kind of uh, research um, uh, program there? Um, and I, I agree that the, the last 30, and I would actually say 40 years, probably starting in the mid-70s, uh, mid uh, are a fascinating time because I think there, there is this kind of interplay between the international economic policies and the domestic uh, political constellations. And um, so um, I think to, to, to focus on that uh, is, uh, is, uh, is probably um, very productive. You could um, make it as in to, to you could solve your paradox by saying it's actually not a paradox. Uh, but the, the, the introduction of liberal constitutionalism on the domestic uh, uh, um, sort of level is actually part of also enforcing a neoliberal economic policy from in the multi level. So if you if you if you want to sort of uh, sort of uh, unravel this, you could say it's it's part of a larger project. It becomes a little uh, tricky then, but I think that could be uh, perhaps one way to. Um, uh, to think about this. And now, final point, um, with regard to uh, at least one or two of the, of the many, many uh, fascinating pointers, points that, that you made, uh, at Tarun. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that this open source metaphor uh, struck a chord, but because I indeed think that uh, uh, the, the, it is an open book. It's something that, um, um, it's something that um, so, so, so many kind of ideas uh, and actions and, and writings can follow from. And, and that perhaps is also a way to diffuse the idea that one or the other only applies, or one or the other can only be part of the um, um, or part of the story. But to see basically that different um, ideas uh, uh, come together and, and, and flow together. Um, just one a point on your um, uh, uh, on your on your critique of, of postcolonial um, uh, studies. Um, I, I I wouldn't go into the the, the let's say the the sociology of the of the emergence of that um, school of thought, but um, I would I would stick to the ideas that it uh, it brings about, and I think what I try to describe as this uh, epistemological and economic dimension of the critique, I think that stands, uh, and that's not just a postcolonial critique; it's a larger kind of I guess critical position or progressive position, but I think those critiques. Um, um, uh, hold true, true no matter where they come from. And then uh, I think it also goes beyond the, um, um, uh, of course, the identity of the, uh, of the speakers. Uh, and um, I think these are challenges to, um, uh, to, to liberalism, constitutional or political or economic liberalism, that one can take uh, very seriously. So I think, um, um, again, I mean, um, ideas matter. Uh, and perhaps there is a uh, there is a there is a sort of uh, uh, a very uh, uh, sort of important uh, element in, in in the critique that uh, uh, it, it, it brought about. And final point, <laughs> I was struck that, that you said yes, um, there are not all not even all countries and jurisdictions in the global north um, um, represented only Germany and the U.S. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and and I feel often very. Uh, different about this because I feel Germany is never really part of that because of one thing, and that's perhaps the, the final point that I want to make, uh, and that's the language thing. Um, I think it's, I mean, we are sitting in the, in the heart of the empire, so to say. Um, uh, it's just incredible how much kind of scholarship is linked to language and how little we talk about language. Um, uh, and so, um, and, and that is normally the big obstacle to understanding or even sort of getting into German constitutional or any legal culture because it's mainly written in German. And even the most prominent of authors uh, are hardly translated. I mean, it's starting now that some of the classics are getting translated. So, um, uh, so I think that's somehow the big, the white elephant uh, also in the room that uh, the sort of what do we do about, about this language and how do we get beyond this? Perhaps, perhaps deep L is, is our uh, solution and perhaps we are uh, sort of uh, coming into an era where, where language differences don't matter anymore. But that would also not be very fruitful, um, but I think that is a, that's a very important topic to uh, to deal with, um, uh, on which I have seen 
fairly little um, uh, scholarship, actually. Okay, thanks. Yes, well, there, there's an awful lot there. Now, I, th I think what, what we can do is um, I'll, I'll start thinking of questions, and when you, if you want to put your hand up, introduce yourself before you ask, and there I can see the, the first hand already, please. Yes. Yeah, so, d would you introduce yourself be before you um, ask your question? And there's a microphone coming. Thank you. I must say, I'm also sitting on, sort of, uh, on my questions and can't really wait to <laughs> pose them. But, but I'll give the audience a chance first. Off you go. Hi everyone. I'm, I'm Jehan, and I'm a postdoc at uh, Pembroke College and also an early career fellow here at the Bonnevere Institute. Um, so I appreciate the fact that many of the um, criticisms against liberal constitutionalism. Uh, is based on or are based on a sort of wrongful notion of what liberalism might stand for. And I think I completely agree with uh, Tarun's comments about the fact that uh, there, there is this misconception that liberalism you know, can be equated with a classical uh, anti-perfectionist notion of liberalism. Um, having said that, and I, I just want to be a little provocative here, uh, and by no means this is an endorsement of this argument, but I just want to bring the, the sort of constitution-making experience of Sri Lanka right now, at the moment, into this debate. Right now, Sri Lanka is at a crossroad where it is uh, faced with a choice between moving down this liberal constitutional model and tinkering with the, the existing model that we inherited and then reinvented in our uh, post-colonial sort of history versus uh, a completely different model. And I, and I think it's important to acknowledge that there are thicker uh, criticisms of liberal constitutionalism and the Chinese influence of sh over Sri Lanka's constitution-making pro uh, project is very significant. And it's not based on a misconception of liberalism. It's actually a fundamental uh, opposition and fundamental sort of um, targeting of what liberalism stands for. And this whole idea that there's a civilizational state that needs to have an authoritarian model simply because liberalism and, and sort of electoral democracy that attaches itself to it is not fit for um, you know, a, a long-term developmental agenda, particularly in a, in a, a post-colonial setting, which has been sort of completely exploited by, by its colonial predecessors, right? So, so then in that context, this Chinese model of um, authoritarianism, a, a sort of different uh, uh, type of constitution is very attractive. And I think it's important to understand that constitution makers in places like Sri Lanka are making choices that are not based on sort of misconceptions, but are based on this idea that, that the liberal constitutional model incentivizes polarization, uh, there's electoral sort of transition, policy oscillation, that's not fit for a long-term human sort of developmental agenda. So I, I just wanted to bring that to the, the debate and perhaps we can talk about it. Should we take a few? Okay, okay that's fine. We have a few this questions online as well. All oh, right, okay. okay. Shall we take one more in the room and then the online question? Thank you very much. Um, my name is Sine. I'm Sine Larsen. I'm a fellow for examination at Modern College, and I'm also a fellow here at the Bonavero Institute. And uh, first off, this was really fascinating. I, I greatly enjoyed it. Um, but what I want to ask you really is how this methodological turn you propose how that impacts the study of the former metropoles, the study of Europe, really, not just uh, domestic constitutional regimes, but also the European Union. I would be interested to hear your reflections upon that. Thank you. And I think we should, we should take the online question as well, um, if you'd like to read them. I'll be filtering the online questions. So from Pran Duan, he asks, how should Global South constitutionalism avoid the comp compartmentalization of liberal rights versus economic justice that some literature tends to impose on the global north, global south dichotomy. Should global south constitutionalism change the lens of constitutional inquiry, even in north democracies like the USA, to issues of redistribution and social rights? Um, then from Lala Dodgenova, she asks, my question is on incompatibility incompatibility of post-colonial, decolonial thought with liberal constitutionalism. Although in theory, I agree that liberal ideas are compatible with post-decolonial thought, 
but I would be interested to hear your thought on liberalism as a current status quo of capitalist and oppressive systems. The post-colonial theory is very critical of neoliberal status quo. In this view, how do you see the integration of post-colonial thoughts into the liberal system in the practice? How your thoughts can be practically implemented? I think that that probably is, uh, uh, in the first instance, a good um, a good starting point. Yeah. I, I, uh, yeah. The, the okay. Um, yeah, starting uh, with your <laughs> your provocation. I mean, yes. I mean, obviously, the, the, it, it's true. But there are there are different models, uh, and there are normative choices to be made. And I think that's the that's the that's uh, ultimately I think it, it's a political question. It's not one of scholarly um, or constitutional scholarship. I would say, um, because I think we we know pretty pretty well. I mean, what it would mean constitutionally to uh, go down the um, the, the path of uh, Chinese authoritarianism. Um, and we also know by now that uh, the idea that, which was until a very recent time quite popular, the idea that you have to go through some authoritarian phase in order to then um, have the trickle down and have a middle class and then comes democracy, uh, for which we saw examples perhaps in Taiwan and South Korea, that this is not something that we can um, sort of expect in all, in all places. Um, and that, on the contrary, we might have to um, uh, look down the path that authoritarianism stays uh, and then um, uh, and, and, uh, is not overcome. And so, ultimately, it is a political choice. I mean, if you think that um, um, sort of there the, the need, needs to be a more kind of hands-on um, authoritarian type of constitutional regime, or I wouldn't say constitutional, it's a political regime then, um, then uh, that's the case. It's actually interesting. I was just uh, these days in a con conversation with Brazilian um, uh, constitutional scholars, and they made a very similar argument about why presidentialism is so strong in the Latin American context, um, uh, and and uh, and why never parliamentary systems came up there. And um, and, and this was about uh, Brazil in the late 1980s when the. Um, a post-authoritarian constitution was drafted, and they said the assumption was that only a president, in that sense, a democratically elected, directly di di uh, elected president, can be that type of strong man, uh, sort of, um, uh, and uh, executive to help uh, on these projects. I mean, as you can imagine, I would be normatively very skeptical, um, because I think there is so much more in terms of um, uh, allowing for liberties uh, on, on, on the political and the, politi and the cultural and the economic side that speaks for uh, a, a liberal model in the broader sense that I think um, uh, my position would be clear. But, um, but, but yeah, uh, ultimately I think it's a, it's a normative and a political uh, choice that, that people um, mm. have, to have to make. And, they and by now, really, we have a lot of kind of case material to look at, so it's not... Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, Sinja, uh, thanks a lot. I mean, that's that's one of the questions that also turns <laughs> to kind of uh, sort of um, uh, uh, sort of uh, keeps me busy. Uh, sort of, what's the impact of these kind of methodological and, and theoretical thoughts for uh, scholarship in European Union law or in, in Europe more generally? I mean, I I don't know. I haven't really gone down this line, but I mean, I think it would start with um, uh, sort of reflecting um, the European Union and its law and its law and political economy, perhaps in a more global context. I think that's what it would start from. I mean, I think, I think new law scholarship has, has gone a long way in becoming also much more kind of interdisciplinary and um, sort of uh, much more dialogical between, let's say, the political science studies of European integration and the legal studies and the like. Um, but I haven't, but perhaps I'm, uh, but I haven't seen in terms of the, the legal scholarship uh, not so much engagement with the comparative scholarship. And I feel that the problem often seems to me that we are still stuck in this sui generis kind of uh, understanding. Um, and then the only comparison that is made uh, 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 mostly is between regional uh, uh, blocks and the European Union. And, and the big exception, of course, is integration through law, Joe Weiler, uh, early 80s. Uh, and I feel that uh, th there the comparison between the European integration and the US. Um, and I, I think in, in that way, um, one, one could go further. So, so that would be one thing to, to, first of all, just start with a more global perspective on European integration. 
But you can also make this, of course, much more critical uh, and then engage with the colonial past of the, of the European project. And I think that is also, I mean, that's, that's already sort of ongoing in, in historical research that, I mean, it's kind of obvious. I mean, the European Union is a kind of replacement of the colonial regimes for, for many of the, of the early member states uh, and the like. And it has a, so I think that would be equally important to see the, and that is really a, the, the multi-level political economy um, um, uh, role that the European Union plays. And I think that should be sort of featured into that. And, and that could be really fascinating, I mean, on, on different tracks. So much more kind of this global thing, uh, the political economy thing, then, yeah. But uh, yeah, I think there's a, but, but I'm, I'm sure that this is already starting somewhere in the PhD schools somewhere, but uh, yeah. It's, uh, I think it's in you, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, very good, yeah. <laughs> so we'll, we'll discuss that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have to admit that I, the, the first question from the, from the chat, I um, um, uh, uh, didn't quite get, I, I, I heard that it was about how to avoid the compartmentalization between economic and civil rights. Um, and um, I'm sure we can just repeat it, it's no problem at all. Uh, yeah. Um, the question was, how should global South constitutionalism avoid the compartmentalization of liberal rights? versus economic, economic justice that some literature tends to impose on the global north, global south dichotomy? Um, I mean, the question is now, who, who are we talking about? Are we, talk, <laughs> are we talking about constitution makers? Are we talking about constitu constitutional scholars? Uh, are we talking about judges in, in, in the courts? Um, uh, but um, so ultimately, I think, um, I think we have already come to the point that we see that there is a very sort of close connection between these two types of rights, which perhaps were in the 60s, 70s, 80s described as a second and third, uh, as a first and second generation. But by now we see the immense kind of interlinkage between the, the political and the, and the economic. Uh, and I think that is really one of the larger points that I would that I would take from critical scholarship more generally that there is a there is really a void. In, um, in constitutional scholarship on the material constitution. That also is, is changing now. I think we, we have a better sense, a be, be, better sense of this that uh, now, uh, but that, um, um, so for example, a colleague of mine writes about uh, uh, corporations uh, in constitutional law. And it's just amazing how, lit how little there is actually on the corporation, which obviously from an economic perspective, I mean, the private lawyer will yeah. immediately agree, uh, is, is, is the driving force mm -hmm. in our economic system. Uh, but in, in liberal constitutional scholarship, it's almost not, not, not represented. It's not really thought about. And once you go in there, you realize how many kind of um, uh, sort of paths are taken and, and sort of uh, choices are made by designing a certain uh, uh, corporations in a certain way by giving it rights to participate in the election, all of that. We, we know that. So, so I think in that sense, um, I think we have already come to the point that this, um, this separation of civil and, um, uh, and, and social economic rights is, is, a, is, a, is a, a, a sort of artificial one and that we should go beyond this and uh, in the North as much as in the South. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't distinguish there. Um, and then the last question was about um, what can we do about the current state <laughs> of uh, oppressive neoliberal uh, uh, policies? Well, yes, I mean, um, I think, I mean, the, the, what can we do about it? We, we, we should sort of name them, we should point them out, and we should um, uh, develop um, uh, the tools to deal with them. But it, I mean, to some extent, this is a question that draws perhaps on the boundary between uh, scholarship and activism. And, uh, and that's an interesting, another interesting field to, to think about sort of where does scholarship turn into activism? Should it turn into activism uh, uh, or not? Um, but I think to some extent, if you want, uh, of course, then you can uh, use your, um, your, your, your scholarly expertise as a, as a legal scholar uh, to point out where uh, law often not in its, in its textual form, but in its application or in its non-application turns into op uh, oppression. And, th and that often then is, uh, is, is the problem that it's not so much the law as written in the books, but the law in the way it is uh, sort of implemented and used uh, by certain actors um, uh, becomes relevant. So I think um, uh, it's, this is not so much uh, a distinction between liberal or, or critical scholarship, but, uh, but about sort of looking at the, at the, uh, at the reality um, of law and, and that should be studied more. <laughs>
Thank you. I, I wonder whether Renata or Kate or Taryn would like to come in on any of the points that have been just raised. Um, I'm going to have to turn my... Taryn, yes, please. Just a quick comment on uh, on the last question, by Kevin. I think if I, I might have understood the comment wrongly, but I think the if the question was about um, the practice of states that call themselves uh, liberal and how that fits with liberal theory, um, I think that there is a difference between. Um, liberal ideals and what self-characterized liberal states do in practice, this is not an unusual distinction at all. So there's not much by way of socialism happening in most self-professed socialist states. And um, demo many democracies fail by the ideal of democracy. You know, most so many of American states, for example, are single party states. Um, so I think that ideals don't become useless because they are not satisfied in practice. Rather, they actually invite us to redouble our normative insistence on their adherence when, when we fail to live up to them. So dismissing an ideal because it's not being realized uh, to perfection, I think, is, is a wrong move, at least if that was what the questioner had in mind. I was going to say, uh, can I invite more questions? Yes, please. Rem remember to introduce yourself, the gentleman in the. Um, the uh, hi, I'm a Gaurav research visitor at the Bonavero and a doctoral candidate at the CEO. Uh, my questions are to uh, to Kate and to Tarun. So I'm curious about how you uh, how what you see are the similarities and divergences in the way that um, constitutional skeptics in South Africa and India are posing their arguments, right? And uh, some of them are posing it in terms of how it is an obstruction to issues of addre addressing issues of material inequality. Whereas in India, it's, it's approached in slightly different terms. So what do you think are the similarities and differences in, in origins and deployments and what the implications are? I'm John Adeline Tira. I'm a research visitor here and a lecturer at Queen Mary. Um, this is a question, I think, more for Kate and Taron as well. Um, you have called for a definition of liberal constitutionalism, and you have proposed criteria or directions in which that may go. Um, why I heard was basically a insistence that liberalism should have something to do with concentration of power in, in, some, in some way. Um, I did not hear anything about the, the link between liberalism and freedom or liberty, um, which seems a bit counterintuitive because it seems there, it's in the name. So, what is the relationship between freedom, liberal constitutionalism, or liberalism as well? Thank you. Do we have any more questions on, online? Yes, we have one more question online from Jun In Yun. They ask, what do you think is the main reason barrier that post-colonial constitutionalism is still underexplored and belatedly getting attention from scholarship in comparison with international law jurisdiction? For example, trial. Trail? T-W-A-I-L. The trial. Yeah. Thank you. Right, shall we take those? And then yeah. Yes, yeah. we'll have you go. Great. Well, those are all um, great questions. So, I mean, I think, um, Gaurav, that I wouldn't want to answer off the cuff. I think it needs some work. We actually need to sit down and look at the critiques. But my, my, uh, uh, I suppose my anxiety is that those critiques, which are rooted in the South African context, they're rooted in, firstly, the provenance of the Constitution effectively as a peace agreement as opposed to a 
um, a sort of an assertion of constitutionalism by an indigenous community. Um, and the, the critiques of that undervalue constitutions as peace agreements. I, I, I think generally across constitutional uh, theory, we undervalue that. And there is an enormous amount, if we all know empirically that many constitutional, we talk about the constitutional moment, that normally a time of enormous change and upheaval and peace agreements, and particularly in societies which are these um, sort of syncretic comp composites, are very often going to be the drivers of, um, of constitutional settlements. And I, I, so I think that there's, you know, those are sort of some of the critiques, and they're rooted on, I think, quite ideological conceptions of nationalism, which, which, which worry me a bit, um, because, for, for, because I think that um, they're not fully thought through. But I think this work needs to be done. I think it's a really good question, and I think we need to take the critiques very seriously, and we need to engage with them seriously, both um, analytically, and uh, so looking at actually what the premises are and the modes of argument, but also normatively. Um, so the second question was about, I'm just trying to remember. Freedom. Uh, oh, yes, sorry, liberal, that's right, John. Um, I, I certainly didn't try and define um, uh, liberal constitutionalism, but, but I actually think it needs to be done. I understand it's difficult, and it will always be working and provisional. But one of the things I think that needs to be done is there needs to be a separation, or as I say, at least a, a not a premise that there's inevitable link between economic liberalism and liberal constitutionalism, because I don't think that's a necessary link at all. If it is, I think you know, anybody who believes in socialism or social democracy sort of needs to go home in a kind of way because I, I can't imagine, um, it, it seems to me that we need to, we need to put that in as a question. But freedom seems to me to be an important part of it. Um, I think a lot of the things I was talking about, and maybe Taryn as well, are thinking about political space to ensure that there, there is contestation about who's in power and it's possible to contest who's in power. But of course, there's another side to that. There's also the side of human aut you know, autonomy, the ability of people to envisage their own lives, to be who they are. And we know that in many authoritarian societies, those elements of freedom are crushed, uh, as well as political freedom. So I do think that would be an element of it. I think it might be a debatable element of it. I think there will be some people who would say you can have a liberal constitutionalism that is based on some relatively narrow conception of human beings which doesn't give them much freedom. I mean, I think there would be contestation, but this would be a normative claim, and like all normative claims would be subject to constitution. But for me, I do think uh, an uh, appealing or plausible account of liberal constitutionalism would have some elements of human freedom written into it. Um, and then the third question was, sorry, just have to remind me again, Rachel. Don't have a pen sure, here. do you want me to just reread it? Yeah. Yeah. Just, um, what do you think is the main reason barrier that post-colonial constitutionalism is still underexplored and belatedly getting attention from scholarship in comparison with international law jurisdiction? Yeah. Well, I mean, the first thing is, if you were to count up in the world how many people are working on constitutional theory and constitutional constitutionalism generally, you're going to find that 90% of them are based in the global north. That's despite the fact that there is far more constitutionalism, you know, that, that, that that's a very small proportion. And that's got to do with reasons of wealth, scholarship, uh, universities, etc., And of course, that, that drives people's interest and engagement. But I do think you're seeing a turn. I think many of us in this room are interested in the, the global south, but the, you know, the power in the academy mimics the power in, in between the first world and, and the global south. So it's not surprising that we are not seeing that. Um, and I think that we are going to see increasingly engagement with these kind of studies. I also think that this may well destabilize some certainties in the global north. So, you know, for example, uh, there is, a, as many of you will know, a, quite a strong contingent in the Oxford law faculty who believe that, you know, it's highly illegitimate for courts to do, uh, to have any kind of real power in relation to determining whether legislation is a breach of human rights, for example. That is considered, as it is in the US, the counter-majoritarian debate, to be like the defining big question of comparative constitutional law. For many of us in the room, that doesn't even begin to vaguely interest us. And I think that's one of the things, I mean, it obviously is interesting, but it's, it's, not, it's not the dominant debate elsewhere. Now, the really interesting question is, why not? 
And I think that's a question for scholars. And so I think you'll find that as you look at more, um, you know, more constitutional settings, you will start rethinking about what the core questions are. And you'll begin to realize that what have been, and I think this happens across comparative constitutional studies, is that the questions are framed very often by a debate that is happening in a powerful state somewhere else. And the issues that actually are live in other jurisdictions don't come to frame the terms of the debate. They also quite often underpin premises, which I think are false, false, which people don't question because they're working from the particular to the general. And actually one of the things about a, you know, a global south term is that we can start insisting that people don't work from the particular to the general and they start realizing that, that mm -hmm. there are a range of different questions that are all interesting. Taryn, did you want to, uh, I can't quite see where the... Pirka, I'm, I'm not sure if there was a question directed to me. It was right. really hard to hear. I see, I'm sorry about that. Um, so, uh, uh, Taryn, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Okay, so uh, Gaurav has a question about the how we should be thinking about the critique of constitutionalism in the glo global south, and he's particularly talking about South Africa and India, and as scholars, how we should be thinking and working on that critique. Um, and I think, Gaurav, you're thinking particular types of critique or just generally? Okay, so that, that's one question that was directed to you, Taran. Are there similarities and divergences between the two? Oh, yes, and whether there's similarities and divergences between those critique in different countries of the global south, for example, South Africa and India, or whether we're seeing that, yes, we're seeing that the types of critique that are being produced actually are similar or are in fact divergent. Thanks, Kate. That's, that's very helpful. And you know, it's, uh, I just think that the, the temptation to resist is agenda setting by Northern debates. And I think this is probably what Kate was referring to in, in her uh, reply to, to you as well, Gaurav, that uh, <coughs> so many of our doctoral student proposals just completely take Northern debates as the debates to have um, for granted, right? And they don't address what really is at stake, what, is, what really is happening in, in Southern discourses. So the legitimacy of judicial review is obviously the big, you know, um, uh, sort of big issue that sucks all the oxygen out in, in the field. But that's why, you know, I, you know, in my own scholarship, I work on things like political parties, guarantor institutions, plutocracy, and constitutional directives, because I think that these are issues that are a lot more relevant to at least some of the southern jurisdictions that I know. And I think in terms of scholarly motivations, that I would think is a quite an important uh, uh, thing to do. It's very hard because so much of our intellectual um, uh, sort of ecosystem is is suffused with uh, with an agenda that is determined by, well, frankly, American scholars. Um, but I think you know. So I don't think there's one thing that Southern you know uh, scholars should focus on or people interested in the South. So there are many things, but uh, but it's important to not uh, not have the agenda set for you by others. Philip, did you want to come in on any of these points? Yeah, I, no, I just wanted to add perhaps one thing on this question. What are the barriers? Um, because I mean, I, I, I also think we have to be mindful of, of the perception that we, that we have. Um, because I mean, there is a lot of scholarship that goes on <laughs> locally or, or in, in, in journals or in languages or in places that we don't really see. So I mean, I think there is, a, there is, a, there is the very visible um, uh, OUP, CUP, uh, icon uh, a kind of scholarship that perhaps is 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 easiest uh, for us to access and that um, uh, that we t take note. But then there's a lot also going on, and um, um, I mean, so for example, in the German comparative law scholarship, there is there is a lot going on, and uh, and there I would say that um, um, yes, I mean, I think why why is it still very much northern centric also in that. Um, uh, in that um, area, I think it's it's to some extent um, uh, that people are are very much used to that, um, and then I think there are very kind of co concrete uh, structures of, uh, um, of 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 making the access 
uh, at least more difficult. I mean, you have to, uh, that's what you, you already hinted at in terms of uh, the promise of contextual work. I mean, or any comparativist knows. I mean, you have to really, then if you want to work on uh, whatever Cameroonian uh, law or Peruvian law, you, you have to uh, sort of go there. You have to build up networks. You have to learn languages. You have to really invest a lot. And uh, it's much easier to write something about the French uh, whatever constitution or the American um, uh, because there's so much literature already on it on which you can build but if you want to uh, do something on, on, a, on a different jurisdiction it is so much more kind of the, the starting investment is so much higher and, uh, and, and I think we have to as, as kind of perhaps sort of more privileged institutions and actors have sort of uh, help people to, to get that sort of to, to get the, the funds so to say to do that in sort of uh, initial investment to say okay we, we help you or, and we, we, we direct you and we uh, entice you basically to go into that, those directions because it is a lot about younger uh, uh, sort of uh, postdoc, uh, uh, doctoral and, and, and postdoc uh, scholars um, and in that sense I think um, um, it is also kind of uh, the barrier has been also in us in, in a way right I mean the uh, the way sort of senior academics um, kind of uh, uh, value the, the work that has uh, has come out. But but I, I, I would end here on a, on a positive note. I think there is, we do see quite a bit of a shift uh, in the last couple of years. So perhaps the barriers are kind of <laughs> falling. Well, perhaps I can take the chair's prerogative at this point to ask some of my questions. I'm not a uh, public lawyer by any means. I'm a comparative private lawyer. So, so forgive me if I come at this from a sort of very... Um, abstract comparative angle. But I think what we've established today, and I'm going to have to try and order my thoughts, there are effectively three questions that build on each other. I think what we've established today is that the sort of old, old style thinking was there's this Western, possibly North American or European centric model of what, what uh, liberal constitutionalism is, is. And then if we find variants of that in, in the global south, we see that as a, you know, that, as a variant of mm of that model, whereas, whereas I think you were arguing very forcefully that actually we, w w w that the North American European variant is just that, it's also a variant and that, so I wonder whether we can get at a definition by sort of lining up the, the different uh, local, locally specific um, notions of liberal constitutionalism and seeing whether there is a common core, I'm sure that has been tried and you were saying that as mm. political scientists so far have failed in that, but, but then my next question is, do we actually see global north, global south patterns emerging if we put these variants next to each other? Um, or is it just that every, you know, every region of the world and every culture and every political and economic system has its own specificities? I mean, are there, are there distinct um, patterns which we emerge in, in these variants? And in order to find out um, whether they, there are and whether there are any commonalities, for instance, between different variants that might be explained by a particular factor. I wonder about the way that such a comparative project, if it was a bigger, you know, bigger project that perhaps involved several people would be framed or how the comparative debate on the global um, forum might be, might be framed because Kate reminded us that if we take this deeply immersed view of the law, comparative law becomes really, really complicated and it might take many years. You also said, you know, you to learn a language and not only to learn a language to build networks, to understand how institutions work, how the culture works. Now that's not something that one person can reasonably do. So how do you build up um, a, a project looking at various jurisdictions by, you suggest, by sending people perhaps, <laughs> allowing them that space for immersion, but also of course by receiving scholars. Mm -hmm. How could one go about setting up a, a I know, you've, I know you've done this um, to, to an extent, but I'm sure you would agree that you know, more needs doing. And so how, what's the next step practically? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, a common core, I mean, that goes in the direction of a definition. I think one can, one can do that and one can probably find, I mean, to some extent, that what's been done in the early 2000s in the global constitutionalism debate. There was this idea that, okay, Ultimately, we are all the same, or we are all very similar, at least. And aren't we all kind of uh, uh, global constitutionalists in, in, in a way? And I think the critique of that has been rightful. I mean, it, it, I think that's too easy. It's to say just because we have we the people in the beginning of the constitution, it doesn't mean that we have this a similar kind of practice, experience, culture, uh, and even normative kind of understanding of how we deal with, uh, with constitutions. So um, to some extent, I would, I would say, um, um, uh, perhaps in a, in a ideological and, uh, and, and naive way, 
this kind of common core has been um, already uh, done. And I think what we are seeing now is the swing back. Mm -hmm. So we see basically, we see the political protest in terms of contestations, in terms of Trump and Bolsonaro and Modo, Modi, and in, in terms of basically people who kind of turn the sort of the constitution against the liberal grain. So we have that kind of, kind of uh, pushback. Uh, and, but I also think we see a much sort of more plural kind of debate in the sense that we have been discussing now, so that we see more scholars from, from other areas than the metropoles uh, kind of uh, joining the discussion. So in that sense, I think we are, I think right, sort of uh, uh, rightfully beyond the common core question mm -hmm. um, uh, in, in, in that sense. Um, the second question was, was is there, can we then ultimately say there is a southern versus a northern model, which is, which is very interesting I, I, as a question. And, and to some extent, I think it's a productive question to ask. I don't know whether we'll come out with, a, with the answer. I don't know whether, I mean, there is, there's a lot of interesting thinking about typologies of uh, constitutions or varieties of constitutional regimes and, and the like. And I think that's a very important uh, um, um, sort of m methodological and theoretical question to engage in. And I would probably say it's, uh, and that's what we do in this article, in the Southern Turn article, is we try to f flag certain issue areas that seems to be typical for um, Southern constitutions uh, or distinct, we say. Um, um, not that they entirely sort of uh, characterize the constitutional experience there, but that we see them often mm -hmm. emerging there. And I would just uh, sort of uh, point to three three elements. So one, I think, is um, indeed has to do with the economic um, uh, sort of uh, 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 dimension. So the material, the, the, the economic question, the development project, as it was called since the 1950s, is much more kind of visible and prevalent in uh, global South constitutions uh, and has been tackled much, much earlier. So it's not, not a surprise that India is the, or the Indian Supreme Court is the country where um, a, a court has basically um, a developed a socioeconomic uh, rights agenda and, uh, and the like. So, it's a, it, it, so, so I think this is one area that we can probably um, uh, uh, find. Uh, another area is, um, um, is, is probably the, the relevance of, of international law uh, on the domestic constitutional development. Um, so to, so to the, the, the sort of the observation that um, uh, we see more external influences shaping the constitutional uh, developments in the global south than in the north, uh, uh, especially if it's not a chosen kind of influence, but it's an, an imposed kind of influence, just that they have to react to certain kind of World Bank or other policies, if that, that's kind of the, the easiest example, but uh, but the like, so that you that you see uh, public law or constitutional law changes that are triggered by um, the let's say the, the larger uh, multi-level level structure. That's 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 perhaps a second kind of element, um, all more in the in the in the sense of questions than than uh, definite answers. But the third, I think, is important also, and that I find is tr extremely fascinating, um, <laughs> also because there's nothing on it really, and that's the question of. Uh, yeah, this fuzzy legal constitutional culture question. Sort of, it's interesting. I mean, I come from a jurisdiction, Germany, which is extremely legalistic in a way. I mean, we 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 trust the law. There is a lot of understanding that somehow following the law uh, is is the right thing to do. There's just no question about it, and that we also have a basic trust that somehow the rule of law, the Rechtsstaat, is beneficial for us. But that I think is a is a conception that doesn't travel easily. I mean, if you would take this to India or to Brazil or to, to many other countries. And I think, um, I think, and that's perhaps also uh, one dimension of post-coloniality post or post-colonial experiences. So how has law emerged and what's the role of the state that is kind of has uh, sort of um, uh, emerged after the colonial? Is it, is, it, is it a trusting kind of um, uh, uh, force and is the law that emanates from that, uh, from that state a, a trusted source, um, or is it an ambivalent um, kind of uh, Jekyll and Hyde kind of uh, um, um, uh, phenomenon? And so, so I think I'm, I, I'm not really aware of much kind of uh, literature on this more uh, legal culture kind of question, but I think that also uh, would be one area where it would be interesting and, and probably fruitful to, to find and describe differences. Um, so, so yes, I think I think it, it's an interesting question, and I think it will it can trigger interesting type of of, of scholarship um, to ask to what extent are there certain constitutional um, um, uh, experiences that are 
distinct and typical uh, uh, for the South versus uh, more the North. And I, and I think it would, I mean, perhaps in 10 years we realize it's not, it's not entirely there, but I think uh, having a couple of more studies on, on in, in, in this regard would definitely broaden our, our, our general understanding uh, for sure. Thank you very much, Philip. I mean, I realize we've practically run out of time. If someone is desperate to ask a question, I would invite you to put up your hand. But if not, it remains for me to thank uh, especially Philip Dunn very, very much for a really stimulating and insightful two hours of, and, and putting, uh, allowing yourself to be bombarded by, by questions in this way. I'd also like to thank our commentators, Renata, um, Kate and Taryn, of course, and p members of the audience who uh, asked questions and contributed to the debate. Um, I'd also particularly like to thank, on behalf of myself, of the whole of the IECL, the Bonavero Institute, and Kate and Taryn for hosting this event and for the wonderful co collaboration. And I understand that there is, in fact, a drinks reception to which everybody is invited. Now, I don't know where it is, but we will follow your lead. <laughs> so um, thank you to everybody, and goodbye. <laughs>